Joining this the meeting call. is being recorded. Hi, Jarasa. So you have Bridget, Winston, Hi. Kristen, and Gabriel on. Um, Gabriel's in listen mode. Let's see. Fabulous. Power breaks. Really good, uh, Kristen. Your note, I haven't written back yet, but your note about HGTV slayed me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it such a nice and different type of relaxation to just veg out for four hours. It's I such know. a story. Which show? My, my mom really likes Property Brothers. Oh, that is a good one. I was really hooked on Love It or List It, Fixer Upper. There were like two or three, and I was actually in Canada for a little while, and I was watching a Canadian one <laughs> mm. called Leave It to Brian. So <laughs> it ran the full gamut. My boyfriend uh, was laughing at me, though, because he saw me on Trulia, like looking at houses in Philadelphia after that, and he's like, put the apps down. Stop. Like, stop, Kristen. <laughs> I thought you were trying to sell your place. Um, I'm trying to sell my place, and I've moved in with him, but the deal is eventually we're moving into a joint. Got it. Property. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Got how about, it. How about for the rest of you? How was your break? Really nice. Good. Lots of relaxation, too. Excellent. Hi, Wendy. Hi, you all. Sorry to be a little late. No worries at all. We are all getting back into the swing of things after yes. <laughs> the new year. Happy 2019 to you. I know. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to kick off the year with us. We are so appreciative. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, well, I will um, first of all give you the heads up, Wendy, that we are recording this. Are you comfortable with that? Sure. Okay. We, it will not be shared outside of um, Elisa's immediate team. Um, so this is Bridget speaking, um, and uh, I will just give you a very quick backdrop, but I think you've got a, a whole lot of context. Um, I am a manager with the Monitor Institute by Deloitte, so part of the team working with Elisa um, and her team internally on the, on the strategy. So I am joined um, by my colleagues Winston, um, Jarasa, and Gabriel. So you'll mostly be hearing me talk. Mostly we're hearing you talk. I'll be asking most of the questions, but they may be jumping in. And then Kristen um, from TFA is with us as well. Great. Um, and um, we, um, Wendy, are at the beginning of this process. We're calling this kind of phase zero of laying the groundwork for the strategy. So we'll be getting together with the team um, in just two short weeks, actually, literally two weeks from today, um, to have a kickoff. Um, but in the meantime, we are um, having a lot of conversations, both internally and externally, to gather perspectives on like, what are the things that Teacher America should be thinking about um, going into the strategy. Um, so that's mostly what we are looking to, to hear about from you. Um, any questions from your side before we dive in? No. Okay, cool. We sent, and I don't know if you had a chance to look at them. If not, it's absolutely fine. Some questions in the interview, or in, excuse me, in the meeting invite, Wendy. Um, if you had a chance to look at them, happy to start if there are any of those questions that like are of particular interest to you. If not, um, I will just dive in somewhere. Um, let me actually, I think I may have looked at these before the holidays. I must say, or I think maybe Elisa shared them with me separately, but they wouldn't have come with me. I, yeah. Yeah. Why don't we, I mean, okay. I now have them in front of me. Um, let, let me, let me just take two seconds. To Absolutely. Again. Okay. Yep. Yeah, this is helpful. Let, let me just first read these and then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So I do have a, a perspective that I think it might be most helpful for me to share rather than sort of going through all these questions. I mean, it, it obviously relates in some way to these questions. Um, so may, maybe I'll just dive in with that. I mean, when I think about like what's most important for me that comes through this strategy process, like what is that? Like, I think answering all these questions might get us there by the end, but it might just be better for me to say here are the, here are the Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, then, that's great. Okay. So, um, you know, um, let, let me attempt to be somewhat coherent. I don't know if this is going to work, but let me actually start with your purpose question because, um, you know, that's where I think at a, at a very high level, you know, when I think about the United States Teach for America, like I think we could at a very high level say education should be about, you know, growing students as leaders who could shape a better future for themselves and all of us. I mean, this is honestly how we think about it globally. Like, but I, I think anything more specific, and I, I want to say more about that than that, I think, I really think that answering all of these questions at a big national level will have limited helpfulness. Like, I actually think we need to answer these questions at deeply local levels. And um, so, so one of my biggest thoughts is actually that if it, I think what's one of the, like I actually think Teach for America's current strategic framework has a lot of strengths and that we would be, you know, I, I think it will be really bad if we become unfocused on many of the core strategies that we've been focused on. But I think there are a couple of missing pieces in the strategic framework. Mm. And, and one of them is actually this orientation towards like, to what end? Like, yes, we're galvanizing the next generation. We're investing in their leadership. We're trying to build a strong community of care and concern and all. But to what end? And, and I think right now the answer is towards the end of one day, all children having an excellent education. And I think we need to get more specific about that. Like both about, you know, first of all, maybe the one day part, like, but seriously in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, like what do we want to see happening for kids? And it's sort of asking the question, like an excellent education, yeah, to what end? And I think mm -hmm. at a national level, we could say, well, we want kids to be able to do well for themselves. I mean, the economy's changing, you know, we need to prepare kids to have meaningful, productive careers and be able to support their families and all of that. So shape a better future for themselves and for all of us, like, you know, the economy, the, the environment's falling apart, the inequities in our country persist like there's so many issues at the community level at the country level at the global level and we need our kids to be solving them for us in a mere 10 or 15 or 20 years or, or less um so like how are we so I, I think at that level and and i actually think that would be a big shift i mean i actually think if you went out and asked everyone across teach for america an excellent education to what end I think that actually people would have all sorts of different things. I think some people would say both of those pieces. I think some would say, I, I think historically we've been so much about catching kids up to, you know, like we've got this huge gap. It creates like their education gaps, their employment gaps. Like we need to catch kids up. And I think, and, and yet I think bubbling up all over the place is a far more aspirational, um, perspective that many, many, many Teach for America core members and alumni and staff members are actually pursuing, like our kids fighting for social justice, changing the system that's holding them back and all of this. Like, so I, I do think that being clear that we care about both of those pieces, like kids doing better for themselves and also kids able to 
make a better system ultimately, like shape a better system, et cetera. Like somehow being clear at that at a high level is important, but then I think we need to embrace the fact that these are conversations that need to be had at the local level and trying to do this nationally, I personally think will end up being a big mistake. Like I think we need, like think about how different the answers to these questions would be if you're growing up in Seattle or mm -hmm. the Navajo Reservation of New Mexico or the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Like given like, and we shouldn't be deciding this, right? Like we've got students and their families um, and other stakeholders in communities who we should really be working alongside to figure out the answer to this question. We should bring all of our own values and beliefs, but we should also understand their values, aspirations, you know, and be deeply rooted in, in this community, what are the challenges and the pathways to opportunity? You know, and also, I mean, we need to be both locally rooted and also in some way globally informed. What are the global trends? Like what, what are the trends that are gonna influence this community? So, so you put all that in the hopper and say, okay, so what is our, and, and the advantage of doing it locally is that not only that you then can kind of privilege the culture and, and values of the kids and families and stakeholders we're working with, but also um, uh, that the local constituents then have real ownership over this vision. Mm -hmm. and it becomes more than like writing on a wall. But then, then we can say, okay, so we wanna see whole communities in the next, 20 years really making progress towards these you know visions that they've developed for students um and we're going to measure that you know as best we can i mean it's hard to measure these things but mm -hmm. you know, we're going to look at i don't know you, you can look at a range of measures and each community is probably going to be different in terms of what measures they have access to but we can look at graduation rates and college going rates and college graduation rates and maybe even employment outcomes like or salary levels i mean you might be able to look at and civic engagement indicators and you know who knows like you then mm -hmm. figure out and it probably is going to be measured in different ways in different communities because the visions are different and their access to data is different but you could then still have some system of saying are we making progress in our communities towards these locally rooted visions of kids shaping a better future for themselves and for all of us so mm -hmm. something to that end. I mean, I'm I'm using a lot of the global frameworks because it's just what I can most easily articulate and access, but there are like fundamental ideas in there that I think are really important. So 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 that's one piece that's very much on my mind. Um and, and then we can go back. Let, let me just say the second piece. I mean, there are only two pieces on my mind. Um the second of which is um has to do with your last question, sort of. <laughs> I'm working it in there at least. I mean, I, I personally think that the focus Teach for America has on, on galvanizing the next generation, leadership development of its people, building a community where everyone feels loved and supported um, are a hundred percent right like if we added like i think we really are missing like i think that can become very focused on ourselves and that we need to refocus everyone to realize these are the key strategies but this is all about this end of aggregate progress for kids in our communities and we need to make sure everything that we're doing is adding up to that and i so but the one other piece I would add is, and, and maybe it's just an enabler to the overall strategic plan, but is around the leadership of the staff members themselves. Like, I think, you know, if, if we have a purpose, which is developing leadership, right? Like we're developing leadership of our students because that's what it's gonna take for them to shape a better future for themselves and all of us. We're developing the leadership of our teachers and our alumni. I think if we have anything other than an obsessive focus with unleashing the leadership of each and every person on our staff, that it actually won't work in the end. Um, like I, this is, I, I would truly put this as the number one risk to teach for America. Um, and I say that for 
A few reasons. One, I don't think we'll be successful recruiting the next generation if the frontline people who are trying to recruit them operate like an old world organization that's super hierarchical. Like it, it is really obvious to people um, who are being recruited. And I, I just, I don't think people are going to want to be part of that. Like they want to be part of a super connected, empowering thing that gives them lots mm -hmm. of ownership and ability to develop and all. Um, secondly, and, and it's so funny because I swear people were telling me this in year one of Teach for America. And I think I thought that they were just, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know, they were driving me crazy, but they were right. Like when they said, how can we be about unleashing the leadership of our students and our teachers and our alumni if we're not about believing in the potential? Like how can we believe in the potential of every kid and every person we've recruited and not in every staff member? And I really think in the end, yeah, it doesn't work. Like, and all the studies would show like all the stuff around like, yeah, like the key to building, so, so, you know, everyone's talking about personalized learning and, you know, if you define that in ways beyond the technology, it's like, yeah, we need every kid to sort of drive their own learning. You know, like we're trying to flip the classrooms, like that's, that's like what the future holds and it's what we'll have to do if we want kids to shape a better future for themselves and all of us. The number one thing you have to do is change the way the teachers think. Like you have to focus on their becoming self-driven, right? Like that's what like the leading folks would say like, okay, we need to change our teacher's mindset because they grew up in a different system. They're waiting for people to tell them what to do. Like they need to, like we need to start developing them in different ways. And then you realize, well, who's the front line to the teachers? The same thing is going to be true. Like if we can't do it with kids without affecting the transformation in, in the teachers, we also won't be able to do it in the teachers without affecting the transformation in, in the staff. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we need to embrace far more, um, you know, just the kind of staff approach to developing our staff that's all about pushing ownership out as far as we possibly can, being clear that, you know, flexibly, you know, putting like hugely investing in people's development. Like a lot of the, I, I think just many, many organizations are moving closer and closer to this as everything changes in our society. Um, and I've already talked to a lot of people at Teach for America's ears off about this, but the book Reinventing Organizations just had a huge impact on me. I mean, it, it basically, talks about how different historical eras need, you know, kind of produce different forms of organizations and how all the changes that have gone on around technology and connectedness and people's desires for participation all have really, like they breed this kind of new kind of organization. And if you look at how most of the super high growth companies are working, I mean, they're moving more and more towards this. And I just think Teach for America is gonna to need to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Are there, so I have lots of follow-up questions on everything you just said, Wendy, but I want to make sure you've gotten a chance to get out where you are. Those are the before. things on my okay. mind. I mean, yeah, I wrote God. them down to be sure I'd get at them, but I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. Um, so I'm going to start from where you just left off and then we'll work back. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm I'm wondering if there are specific things in terms of the way that Teach for America operates today um, that you would cite around this risk. Um, so I heard you talk, for example, about ownership um, and needing to kind of push ownership throughout the organization. Are there other specifics about organizational dynamics, structures, um, anything else specific that you would cite as um, around that that issue? Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, to be clear, I kind of, of course, had a lot to do with building the current operating system and culture and all. Um, so this isn't, and hopefully no one will hear this as blaming the people in the puzzle at the moment. I mean, but it's more just that the world has evolved so much. Mm -hmm. And I just think we have to evolve, therefore, yep. too. Um, so like the things that and and as I am about to say this, I'm like, yep, I mean, I built that. Like, we have a deeply consensus-based process, right? That, I mean, it could be worse. It could be, like, 
authoritarian, you know, like you go do this, like, no, like we like grew up in a different era. Like we grew up in a consensus based era. Everyone has a say, we shape these. And, and I would actually say, that's not where we want to be. Like we want to be like, we want people able to make decisions and we want to make sure that they're getting advice and, and, and that they're not putting the organization at risk, but that the people closest to the matter are, are feeling true ownership to make the decisions. Like they, they must get advice from the people most impacted and the people who've, you know, have the most experience on the matter, but then they need to use their best judgment and make the decision. I mean, that's just not how, that's not the organization I built. Uh, and I, and my observation is it's definitely not, uh, it, it's not the way it operates now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's very, it's, then this isn't even about not being hierarchical, but it's more like people are looking up for like approval so much versus like really feeling like I own this. I just need to make sure I've got the full context, you know, and, and, and the perspective from people who've been there before. That's probably, that's one thing I think, um, you know, Wait, there, Wendy, can, can you give an yeah. example of what you mean uh, by that? Just to make it a little more concrete for us. Sure. Like take a recruiter out on a campus. I mean, I, I, this happened a few years ago and I've probably shared this example with people before and there are many others where this came from, but maybe this will help, you know, like, I was on a campus, there's a recruitment manager there, and we're in this room, and there were very few people there, and I said, you know what, I'm not going to stand up at the podium, let's actually just bring people together in a circle, and let's just change the format and have a discussion, and the person's response was, let me ask my manager. Now, and, and college students heard that person say that too right so like first of all you know what you don't need to ask your manager this like if you have a concern about it then you can you should you should say no we're not going to do that i mean maybe you want to get advice from your manager but it's just not the way it was said it was like i can't i can't tell you that that's okay so i'm going to go check um mm. no like we need, and, and, and that's the most minor of, of things. Like that was sort of irrelevant, right? Who cares? But like it happens so many times a day, right? Like, and, and I, don't, I don't know if that helps at all, but that, that's one thought. And, and the other is, I do think, you know, we can get to a point where we're much more flexibly allocating our resources against the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities. Um, you know, like you look at how, these high tech companies work in terms of saying, oh, we don't have long term plans. Like what we have is, you know, we know the we know what we're trying to accomplish and we're bringing our people back together frequently, like every three months or every two months or whatever to say, OK, what are our biggest, you know, we, risks and, and opportunities and and like let's reallocate like let's make sure that our our people are on all the right stuff and I think that that too I mean one it provides huge developmental opportunities for people and it's just much more much more resourceful as well and it, it ends up being much more strength based for your people too like you know you should be able even if you can't manage a hundred people you should be able to be one of the most valuable people to teach for america because management of a hundred people is not all we care about right like you should be able to be an individual contributor across like five things like you could be solving massive problems and adding enormous value like i, I think we have one way like people come in they're hired for a job and they do that job versus hiring people who could play across multiple functions and, you know, so I think there's, those are maybe two of the big principles, I would say, like flexible allocation of, you know, being able to work in a flexible and agile way, pushing decision making down, and, and maybe the third being like, you know, really investing in people, like in our, in their coaching, their development, like having lots of avenues for people to develop beyond just say, in fact, I would move away from the notion of a manager, like you know, all together actually and say, okay, we're gonna have team leads maybe, you know, may, but we're not gonna say one person has to manage all these people and that's where all their development is gonna come from. Like we're gonna set up a system so that people can get their development from many different places, can play on different teams, can, you know, like it's obviously just a different way of operating. But I think 
it's a way that many, many organizations that are very high and effective in today's world are moving towards. That's great. That's really helpful. Any other questions, team, on that front? Um, so continuing to kind of work backwards, Wendy, from what you shared, would love to probe a little bit more around um, this, uh, this issue of the importance of local context um, and the, uh, the need for specificity at a, at a national level. Um, and wondering if you could say a little bit more about given what you have underscored about how important it is to solve problems locally, what is the importance or the role of the national organization? Like what kind of impact does that national organization need to be able to claim um, given it's, you know, the importance of what's happening locally? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, gosh, I do think a lot of thought has been given to this, and I'm not sure I would disagree with where Teach for America has come out on it. Like, I think it's uh, several things. Like, um, the most central is, is, you know, building capacity of the local, you know, essentially teams mm. and helping them and the teachers and alumni across these different uh, regions learn from each other. Um, you know, like what we built initially to sort of manage from the center, this high growth organization, we've already started, I think, to transform into something that's putting all that central control energy into just helping people, like helping people build capacity and, and helping them learn from each other. So I think that's maybe the most central function. Um, but there are probably some other functions too. But I, I think TFA has enumerated these well already and probably isn't wanting to revisit the definition. But, you know, from, you know, building a national brand and obviously the recruitment effort is still national. So like, you know, mm -hmm. succeeding in, in galvanizing the next generation to um, maintaining the standards across, you know, at some level, like, if, regions have to live up to a certain baseline, you know, in order to, to stay a part of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Bridget, I had a follow up though, because Wendy, I'm still trying to understand. Um, one of the things you said was it's really important or agile organizations, they're all in agreement on where they're trying to go long term and they are constantly revisiting how they're doing it, but they know where they're trying to go. Um, and then the piece I was trying to figure out is when you were talking about, um, you know, the one day all children, that statement and how um, there needs to be effort paid to, you know, what an excellent education really means and that that might look different locally. I am struggling to figure out how to thread the needle between um, what you said before. How, how do you ensure your um, taking in local context while coming up with an answer to know where as a, a national organization you're headed. So, and, and I'm kind of, you know, I'm very cognizant of the fact that what I'm about to say is, is how Teach for All has solved the problem. So I don't know, you know, but, but, you know, it's the best thinking I have personally on it. Like, I do think that if, if where you're trying to go is whole communities, regions, in your case, like all over the country, making aggregate progress for kids so that their kids are able to, again, I mean, this is like our lingo and I overuse it, like shape a better future for themselves and all of us, navigate a change in economy, solve increasingly complex problems. Like that's the big what. It's like, okay, well, what do we have to do to get there? I mean, there are a lot of things you have to do, right? Like you have to be a source of many more leaders who can help alongside many others get us on a path to that. Um, we have to develop their leadership in ways that will, well, that, that, you know, that covers recruitment and leadership development, but that's, that's a huge part of it, right? We need to help these communities, you know, 
support them in developing their more contextualized visions for what does that mean in this community? Kids shaping a better future for themselves and all of us. What does that mean? Like really, like what's the localized contextualized statement of that? How are we going to measure progress towards that? And then start looking at, okay, which communities are making progress and how do we surface the learnings from those to inform the other communities? Like there are lots of things you would end up coming up with. It's like, okay, we want whole communities making aggregate progress towards locally contextualized visions for student success students shaping a better future for themselves and all of us what are the biggest rocks like you would come up with a list like okay well we better do x y and z and feed into q is that helpful though i mean tell me if not it is helpful i'm still struggling a little with well i think i'm getting what you're saying i'm still struggling a little with um the whole organization understanding exactly where they're going. Essentially, it's like a measurement question. Like I've heard Elisa say, we've got to measure what matters most. And I'm struggling with how you define what matters most um, as an enterprise when it needs to also be locally driven. Um, yeah, I mean, you would end up, I, I think we've always struggled, if I'm correct on this, maybe, maybe if you took a longer term frame, you could use NAEP scores in the US context, but it's not like we had one way of measuring academic progress across the country, right? Like we had every region, I think this is right, still like using the most relevant academic measures. And then we're looking across at our people meeting some standard of growth using their local measures. Is, is that still how we do it? So like you just do it the same way, right? Like I actually think you may well be able to start using, you may have access to a, a national measure of socio-emotional skill development. Like you may be able to bring that in. So you could say, here's a tool that everyone could use. And, and I actually think I mean, for learning purposes across Teach for All, we have global tools and they'll never be as strong as the local ones, but like we're supporting them to have local rigorous tools that, that really get at as closely as possible what they're aiming at. But then, you know, we use the student survey, which has been found to be better than any other measure on the market for correlating to whether teachers impact, you know, academic and socio-emotional development. <clears throat> that's just one little micro survey that's just one little micro thing not at like are we making progress at whole community level but we're using the same approach of saying okay what's the best we can do like we've developed a rubric for example like our communities making progress like so they have to contextualize like they have to pick their local measures they have just like the, our regions of teach for america need to pick their own academic measures um you know to look at that um but at least it provides some way of measuring progress and orienting people towards what matters most and <clears throat> enabling us to learn across. Like, okay, well, which communities are making the most progress based on the measures they picked? Let's figure out what they're doing differently. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this front team? Um, the issue of kind of local context, but national organization. All right, let's move on. I um, Going back to something you said very at the very beginning of the conversation one day that we wanted to probe around was, um, you said that you think there's a lot in the current strategic framework to hang on to. Um, and so I would love to hear from you about what you think is critical to hold on to. And also, I guess, let me test an assumption if, um, if it's an accurate assumption to say that the things you think are missing are what you articulated, or if there are other things you would say um, are, are currently missing. Yeah, that's actually, I mean, when I looked at, and I can't remember exactly, but Elisa put up at the last board meeting, I think she had four or five priorities. And I, it, they weren't exactly the three, um, whatever those are called, you know what I'm talking about, someone 
there are three big things that not the breakthroughs no right they're not the breakthroughs but they were very related and there were four or five of them and maybe they just also included the enablers i'm, I'm forgetting but like i was like why do we need to go through a strategic plan You're like literally we have the strategic plan that's it mm -hmm. like let's not rethink this because if we unfocus ourselves on any of this, it's going to be a really bad thing. Galvanizing the rising generation. I mean, of course, there are many strategic questions within that, but I think there are other ways of getting at those, like, how are we going to do that? Um, and that's the thing, like, at what altitude can we possibly answer this? So, like, galvanizing the rising generation, investing in the leadership development of the teachers and alumni, like, and I think TFA is so on the right path there, and in having articulated the, the types of leaders you're trying to develop and fostering experimentation around different leadership development approaches. So of course that's gonna take many more years and you've just spent two or three years figuring out how to even get that to be what's happening. And I would just be sure not to take the foot off that pedal. And then I think that the focus on building a strong community, um, and I don't know what form that you know, how you all feel about that. But I actually think that was totally right. Like, you know, and I think that was course correcting for not having that earlier. And we saw the downsides of that. Like if, if all you're doing is driving towards outcomes for kids and people being strong leaders and they're doing the hardest thing you can ever do and not feeling love and support, it just, all falls apart so like I think that's also really important not to lose um, so then I guess all I'm saying is if those um, yeah let me just think through I mean if you added to it an overall vision around let's say communities making aggregate progress for kids or something like this or whatever you want to call it, if that's not the vision it's something else but that's what you're trying to accomplish ultimately. Then in order to get there, um, yeah, you'd, you'd need, yeah, more extraordinary leaders, you'd need more learning and sharing across. Um, so maybe that's another one. I mean, I hate to create more stuff in here, um, but, you know, it is true that those communities learning from each other, the teachers and the alumni in particular learning from each other and the staff members, like everyone learning from each other across is gonna hugely accelerate progress. Um, so maybe that is another big thing that I would consider. It, Actually, it may not show up elsewhere, yeah. I'd love to um, explore a little bit more with you, Wendy, on the point about alumni specifically. Um, it may not come as a surprise to you that that, um, in especially our internal conversations with, um, with staff leaders, um, has come up a lot. Um, that there's um, that it's a that alumni are a big opportunity and and something as you've described that the organization has already begun to. Um, tap into, but um, we're hearing that there's much more opportunity there. Um, so we'd be really interested in your thoughts on, you know, what do you see as the alumni opportunity slash gap? Um, what does really activating learning among those alums look like, for example? Um, any thoughts that you have about kind of further unleashing that potential? Um, <clears throat> I mean, actually, my biggest thought, and you know, I really want to talk about this, but I just had, let, let me not lose one other thought. Oh, I mean, please, go ahead. I'm sort of like in saying like, I really just think there's one missing thing in this focus on unleashing the leadership of the staff. I'm probably just assuming that, I mean, it's the thing that I fear won't come out clearly enough from the normal process here that's going on. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of other things will, but I also think they're important. So I'm not really saying just think like, for example, focusing on a broader set of outcomes for kids. I mean, TFA has been doing that, but I think, you know, we're not going to prepare kids to navigate a changing economy and solve all these problems if we don't focus on a broad set of outcomes for kids. And if we don't train and support teachers to teach differently to get there. So like, I could imagine saying, well, if we're going to get whole communities doing this, 
we need an imperative around supporting all these regions to work towards a broader set of outcomes for kids. Um, like that's maybe we need systems for helping them all learn from each other. You know, we need, who knows? I mean, mm -hmm. I, think, I think you could end up with a set of things that emerge from that that are possibly slightly, ever so slightly different from, from the current. I would just hate to lose what you currently have as well. Um, to the alumni point, I actually think personally, again, you probably hear so many things and there are probably so many things, but my biggest thought is that if you were focused on this community's making progress and went through a process of kind of co-creating with local constituents, with our alumni, but also with students and families and business people and other community stakeholders at the table, what we're actually working towards for kids in this community. And that was the starting point for many, many conversations. Like you've kind of created the space to say, okay, well, are we on a path to this? <laughs> like you, you get your teachers together, the core members and are like, okay, well, whatever you do, like forget this idea that you're gonna come in having spent possibly a mere two days in this community and set a vision for your students. No, like we have a vision. Like we've, you, you will be invited to the process of evolving this over time. But for now, like let us help you understand why this vision is what it is, where it came from. Just be sure that whatever you're working towards in your particular classroom is consistent with this. It's like putting kids on a path to this because this is what matters to the constituents who came before you who are in this community. Um, so then that becomes the foundation for bringing everyone back. So it's like, okay, let's keep bringing those allies back together, the students, the families, and others to say, are we on a path to this? What more do we need? And bring your alumni into that conversation so that they're mm -hmm. coming together saying, yeah, what more do we need to do? And this has always been, it's, it's kind of bizarrely elusive. I mean, it sounds so obvious. And before I left EFA, I myself tried innumerable things to get this to happen. And I would go myself to communities and be like, okay, let's bring together all the Oakland alumni and all the Houston alumni and all of this. And they would literally be like, first of all, every one of those meetings, the Atlanta alumni, I mean, I can still tell you what came from those meetings. Like we'd meet for an hour and a half and they'd be like, you know what? We need to turn over the school board. Should we do that? Is anyone here? Would anyone run for school board? Sure. Okay. You know what? You are going to run for school board. We are going to elect you to the school board. And then it's like, okay, a year later we have four out of seven school board members, but those meetings wouldn't keep happening. Like, it's just so elusive. And it's like, yeah, we need to turn over the school board and we need to do like dozens of other things. So like, how do you create the space that keeps bringing people back together to keep saying, okay, really are we on a path to this? And what more really needs to happen? I mean, not just with ourselves, but with ourselves and allies and others, um, you know, I could go on and on about this. I actually think it's just, you know, like we, we held the, you know, we did these meetings called the Philanthropic Leadership Council gatherings in the U.S. in, in Teach for America in different major urban areas. And the idea was to say, let's bring philanthropists to understand what we're learning in these communities. And we did them in New Orleans and Memphis and D.C. and, and then finally in Los Angeles um, to really reflect on like what's happened in these communities and what have we learned, you know, and, and what's the path forward. And in the last of them in Los Angeles, um, I mean, the big conclusion was we had like you know, LA has everything, right? Like they've got incredibly, they've got this such a strong educational ecosystem. Mm. Like think of a piece of the puzzle. There's someone generally working it towards transformative change in the general direction that we're all trying to go. You know, you've got diverse leadership. Like these are some of the big lessons, right? Like we need leadership around the whole ecosystem. Like one piece of the puzzle is not going to do it. That leadership must be diverse and inclusive of the people who have experienced the inequity or it's not going to be sustainable. They've got that. So, but what they didn't have was any, any place where they would come together and think together. So they just felt like we're all rowing in slightly different directions. We actually pretty much like each other. 
like that's not the case in, in many places i must say <laughs> where they won't even talk to each other it's like okay i know you're not talking to each other have you ever had dinner together no we've never had dinner together like we're all tfa alums some of us are running this some of us are running that we hate each other but no like a space to have dinner together no we would never do it like how do we create the space and if you read the system change literature like the dawn of system leadership which is a short article by peter senge and others it basically like it's kind of the piece i mean you know what what characterizes systemic change across sectors it's like this notion of space that enables diverse constituents to build relationships have the debates have the difficult discussions sort through towards shared vision, you know, that's just such a critical piece. And I now know how challenging it is. I mean, it's so difficult. Um, but I think figuring that out, that's one of our biggest priorities across Teach for All, like fostering experimentation, figure that out, because it's very elusive. Do you have any emerging hypotheses? Um... Because I, I, I well, I'll just share that also in our um, what you are describing has also come up in particular in our internal our conversations with leadership um, internally. Um, yeah. And this notion of tensions within the network and um, the alumni network and you know different viewpoints, different stakeholders, um, and even the tension of the degree to which Teach for America, you know kind of has a perspective and a point of view on something versus plays a more neutral, you know, more so advocacy role in bringing people together around advocating for something versus neutrality and kind of uh, just a more neutral convening role. Um, that was a whole bunch of things <laughs> kind of yeah. tied into one, but. Yeah. Well, my, my personal hypothesis is that if you make the foundation the question of what do we want to have be true for our kids by the time they're 25 you start changing everything mm -hmm. because and that that's the question we we would ask say like okay what do you mean by student vision students shaping a better future what's like well what do we want to have be true like let's consider like where will the world be by the time our kids are 25 what are our values in this community, like diverse stakeholders, like really what do we wanna have be true? First of all, it's, it really is such a unifying question. Secondly, you realize it turns out we're all thinking different things on that question. Like over and over and over, you start realizing people assume we know, but we don't know. Like we've got lots of teachers and alumni with different ideas. We've got parents with different ideas than we even knew they had. Like we haven't been asking the most fundamental of all questions, right? Mm -hmm. Once you do ask it, you realize nothing, if we all won our debates, we would not get there. Like the charter schools aren't gonna get us there. They would realize that because it's like, oh, but if that's what we want, like not that some charter schools aren't really pioneering and innovating but like a lot of our charter schools are focused so narrowly right now that they they actually will not be producing kids who are going to lead the future so it's like wow well, we would have to rethink in fact when i had this conversation recently in the board meeting some of our own people were like you know who some of the biggest people would be who would hold us back from being able to focus on broader outcomes be our own people it's like yeah so we better get them in this process like if they're not in the process like those processes are what will help people realize okay we need to think more broadly so to me i think our role should be facilitating the process trying to hold the space mm -hmm. um and then keeping bringing people back together around the fundamental question of is this still what we want to have be true for our 25 year olds and what more do we need to do to get on a path to that? Mm -hmm. I do worry a bit that somehow we've outsourced that in our minds to Lee. Mm. And that's a whole other dynamic, but that concerns me a lot. Cause to me that this should be like the core of what TFA is, is all about. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? In what ways does it, do you have I don't even quite understand it but whenever I'm talking many times if I'm talking to a TFA person and they're I mean everyone's always asking this kind of question so I'll be like well here's my thought it's like yeah I think that's what Lee's doing <laughs> you know and I just think uh -huh. you know I, I don't think it's 
that's, I mean, it may be that there's a big role for Lee to play. I don't quite understand it. I don't, I haven't delved in enough to understand it. I don't get why that would be the answer. But I think if, if our goal is communities making progress, there will be no option but to start operating in this way. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, great. Um, team, any other questions on this front? Otherwise, I'll shift gears a little bit. Um, Wendy, we wanted to ask you about, um, obviously you have been through many um, strategic, you know, many rounds of strategic um, planning and, um, and are very close to the organization. Um, one theme that we have heard in our conversations is around change management and the importance that change management will play in this, um, in this strategy. Um, so we just wanted to ask if there were any, any thoughts um, from from your perspective about you know, considerations for change management, how to ensure that um, the strategy is uh, kind of effectively communicated, embraced um, any unique organizational dynamics that should be taken into consideration? Uh, I, I probably, this is a hard one and I'm not sure. I mean, the, the things that actually, I'll share the things that most come to mind in case they might be helpful. One, I, I'm really, I'm actually really worried about the strategy process. I'm sure many people are, there's lots uh, at stake. Um, but I'm worried that our um, desire, like that actually our ways of working, our consensus driven ways of working, will lead us to have this very encumbered long process that will that that might not even generate the the simple answers that we actually need mm -hmm. and um i personally think that what matters is and and this is why i actually think changing our way of operating otherwise like we may need to be clear that actually we're changing our way of operating because if not, it can seem too inconsistent with this. But I think a lot of people would like to see a really powerful, simple strategic framework that they feel is, is really generally right rather than be engaged in a hugely, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think get there, you know, in a way that is pretty expedient and, mm -hmm. And that gives you a lot of confidence because you got to hear from lots of diverse people. You know, the people who you think are most grounded have the best perspectives on all these questions. But like, I think we could pretty quickly get to a strategic framework and then put all of our energy into this change management stuff versus thinking that the change management is going to come from this very long consensus driven mm -hmm. process if that makes sense so yep. then once you have a strategy then i think my approach to change management would be relying on what the strategy is but yeah i mean of course all of us underestimate all the time what needs to go into change management so it, it seems like a good thing to have top of mind but i those are the biggest things um that come to mind i think yeah that's really helpful um we are coming up to wrapping up. I wanna, I guess, invite team if there are any other burning questions um, for Wendy or Wendy, just anything else that you want to make sure we you know, don't leave this conversation without. <laughs> I mean, we haven't the, hit on yet. the one, when I set out um, on our last strategic planning process, I mean, I was actually terrified because I felt that the last one I led at TFA was only so productive um and after first postponing our process by a year i then spent six months trying to figure out how to avoid even doing one and i started talking to people and that's what led me actually i mean i ended up meeting these folks who had spent a lot of time studying these very high growth companies i mean all of which now have massive problems from facebook to google to the next one but you know and they they said basically yeah they don't they don't strategic plan anymore. I mean, that's just not what they do. Like they figure out what's the big goal for the next 
five or 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then they develop an agile, flexible way of working that enables them to constantly reevaluate where to put their energy. Um, because the world changes too quickly. So like whatever you figure out in a strategic plan is, you know, pretty much moot by the time you've gotten the change of management done. Mm -hmm. um, and that was exactly the definition of what had happened in my last round at TFA. Like we spent a year developing a plan and then realized this wasn't the most important stuff to focus on given where the world was um, or the country was. Um, so I guess I, I, it brings me back to the question of exactly what questions are we trying to answer? Like, are we trying to answer what's the big goal in the next 10 years? Are we trying to answer Therefore, what are the biggest imperatives? Like what are the six things or five or four or three things that we're gonna focus on at a national level in order to get there? Um, and then that's it? Or are we trying to do something other than that? You know, like mm -hmm. I would vote for that. And, and I think if that's what we're trying to do, you could probably get there in a way that feels very inclusive, like hearing lots and lots of, everyone's thoughts but then where you're clear that you know us this decision is going to be made like we're going to listen to everyone but we're going to value kind of clarity over consensus or what, whatever the thing is um i actually think anyway that that's those are my biggest thoughts is is and i know lots of thinking has gone into this and i've seen various iterations of the process that are somewhat along those lines but i'm still probably trying to figure out <laughs> how this is gonna play out from here. You all are much closer to it. Do you all have other questions though at all about any of this? You know, this was tremendously helpful. I think we hit on the main questions from our side, but I'll open it up to the team once more to see if there's anything else you wanted to make sure we hit on. Um, and I um, am confident, Wendy, this will not be the last time that we yeah. will be interacting. Um, and obviously, if any thoughts occur to you um, as, as, the, as we all continue to ramp back up post-holidays, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Well, and let me just say, and Kristen, thank you for your note. I mean, um, I have so much energy for this. Like, nothing's more important than this process in my mind. So I really would be more than happy to talk whenever you all would like. Um, so just let me know. But I, I know it's good. You're going to talk to lots of different folks and, you know, just let me know if it's ever helpful to talk again. Great. That's excellent. We appreciate it um, and may very well take you up on it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Fabulous. Sounds all right. Good. Thank you again, Wednesday. Thanks, you all. Thanks for doing this so soon after the holidays. Okay. Bye. Likewise. Thank you. Bye, yeah. all. Bye. Take care.